We good? There it Welcome, is. Welcome, everyone. Let's talk about social inclusion. And let's talk about today uh, how people perceive inequality between different groups and how these perceptions influence their support for policies that well, aim to create a more level society. And I have invited Arnim Langer to join this conversation and to talk about, to uh, explain more about fairness, about social cohesion, well, and the power dynamics at play in this multi-ethnic world. Arnim, welcome to our episode. Thank you very much. So there is extensive research on attitudes towards reducing inequality between well, rich and poor, the so-called vertical uh, inequality, but little research, apparently, you say this on your article, on uh, attitudes towards reducing inequality between uh, ethnic groups, so horizontal one. So is this why you uh, this study was born? Yeah, I think that you put it very nicely. Um, there is a lot of research, as you as you referred to it, between the redistribution attitude between the, the poor and the rich, uh, vertical inequalities. But when it comes to group-based or horizontal inequalities, and we're thinking in that context about, for instance, ethnic group or, or um, caste groups uh, or religious groups, uh, the type of, uh, there's actually quite uh, little research done in understanding what are the main determinants of people's attitudes towards this group-based re re redistribution, what we call horizontal redistribution as well. Now, the paper, the, our paper is focusing on Nigeria, but it's part of a larger special issue, which actually looks at these issues uh, across the globe and has cases on Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Malaysia, United States. All, and, and the reason why I'm mentioning that is actually that these group-based inequalities or horizontal inequalities are actually present in many of these societies. And these are issues that are incredibly important and deserve to be researched. And the focus of, of our paper is Nigeria, which is a fascinating country and an instructive case for studying these issues, not only because it's a multi-ethnic and uh, multi-ethnic society with three dominant groups, the House of Fulani in the north, the Yoruba in the southwest, and the Igbo in the in the in the southeast, but also because it's a country that has over the years, actually since independent, introduced a whole range of measures and policies in order to address these group-based inequalities. Uh, most notably the, was the introduction of the Federal Character Commission in 1996, which was really aimed at maintaining fair and equal distribution across ethnic groups uh, when it comes to, for instance, public positions and, 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 and uh, distribution of, uh, of, of all kinds of government contracts. And but the inequalities are still very severe in Nigeria. And hence that, that offered us a, a sort of a, an interesting and intriguing question, actually, how people perceive these, these, uh, these policies that have been undertaken and to what extent they support it are actually against uh, these policies. So let's follow up on it. Good uh, context for the, for the study. So what are these determinants? What are the main highlights of what you found? Well, the thing is, there is has been a lot of research, as you mentioned, on attitudes towards uh, vertical inequality, so between the, the rich and the poor, or, or, or sometimes people refer to as class-based inequalities. And that was sort of the basis for, for, for us to, to look at that literature and see whether certain elements or hypotheses or theories that were, are present in, in that literature could actually be tested also, and could also help to explain attitudes towards horizontal redistribution, so redistribution between groups. And from that perspective, that was the basis. We also looked, I have to say, that's a different literature, but also an important literature. Uh, we looked at the literature that focused on attitudes towards affirmative action in the United States. That is actually a, a quite a large literature which, which focuses on group-based uh, redistribution, but it's really the United States that has been picked out as a country that, 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 well, most of the research focuses on the United States. Now, those are the two literatures that we took as the basis for starting to theorize about possible, um, possible drivers of, the, of people's attitudes towards redistribution. Now, what we found, there are a couple of things that we found. First of all, the fact that uh, the severity, the perceived severity of the prevailing inequalities is an important driver of people's attitudes. Now, it, it goes very much along 
what people intuitively would think, the more severe people think inequalities are, the more likely they are to support redistribution. But I, I do have to add immediately here that we also find that people's perception of the prevailing inequalities might actually differ from the objective situation. And that 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 is quite, quite important because that in turn tells you something that people might misperceive and hence might misperceive the actual situation. And because of that, might have an influence on their attitudes. Another important driver is the fact that um, relates to, I should say, to how people perceive the origins of the prevailing inequalities. And in that regard, uh, what, what comes out and, and comes out very strongly in our, in our data is the fact that the more people um, put the responsibility for the disadvantagement that certain groups have with the groups themselves or the group members themselves, the more they are against redistribution. Conversely, the more people think that the inequalities are the result of contextual factors or historical factors, such as, for instance, discrimination by past regimes, the more they are in favor of redistribution. Now, and, and, and then the last element that also uh, that jumps out is uh, there are a number of additional ones in the paper, but are fairness considerations. Fairness consideration is the more people think the existing inequalities are unfair, the more they support uh, redistribution, uh, group based redistribution towards disadvantaged groups. And fairness consideration is an element, for instance, that also comes out in, in, in the literature of, of um, vertical redistribution, or so in, uh, measures aimed at uh, reducing class base or, or inequality or inequality between poor and rich. That also jumps out in, in group-based inequalities. And mm -hmm. it's important that, well, we, we emphasize in this regard that fairness considerations might differ between countries. I mean, there's a lot of research showing that, for instance, uh, fairness considerations in the United States are very different from fairness considerations in European countries. Um, similarly, it might differ between individuals, and that's also what we, we notice. And there's a lot to be learned in this regard in terms of what drives these fairness considerations and norms of 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 social justice in this regard where they come from and and that is definitely something interesting to to further uh, research uh, in this regard yeah we'll go there so a lot about um how the perception can be different from the reality if the origin of the problem is by the group themselves uh issues of fairness so in a nutshell, what could policymakers do with these findings? So if they listen to this episode and they heard these findings, so what could they do, the practical implications of this? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the, the first uh, first thing to take from these, from these um, findings is actually the fact that you cannot just rely on the objective situation. Uh, and that is, um, that is something uh, that we tend to do because data, survey data and, and perceptual data are not readily available. So we go back to objective data and say, okay, this is the situation. But once we realize that people's actions and support uh, for, for policies are, is very much dri driven by the perception of reality that they hold. And we add to that the fact that we actually see that people's perception of the prevailing inequalities, of the actual inequalities, can be very much different from the actual situation. Putting that together tells us that if we want to design policy, and if we want to think about introducing, if policymakers want to in, um, are considering introducing policies and maybe increasing popular support for policies, which, which is necessary if you want to maintain these policies for a longer period of time, then it's crucial to really come to grips and understand people's perception of the prevailing situation. Um, because linked to that is, even when there are policymakers considering um, introducing uh, policies to address horizontal inequalities, one of the things is that horizontal inequalities has shown themselves to be incredibly persistent so 
it's not unheard of that disadvantaged groups remain in, in positions on, of inferiority for decades or even centuries. So these policies need to be in place for a long period of time in order to have some effect on the actual inequalities. But that also requires that you need to have popular support for these policies. And that is really something driven by perceptions. And, and, and hence, we need to see whether we, we policymakers need to be aware of that if they want to have um, I want to be able to introduce a successful policy that can actually count on popular support or, or wide, widespread support among the, the population. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, take a step back. Let's follow up on what you were saying before. So if you could tell us more about now future research, so perhaps uh, some other dimensions to be included in this analysis, or if you said uh, some more national comparisons, as you said, these country differences. So what's ahead of us now? Well, there's a lot. I mean, the, we see this um, as a start because it's it's just um, it's a fascinating area of research where little research has been done, and that that for a researcher that's obviously opens doors for for many avenues of future research. Now, first first area of future research is actually linked to the to research limitation uh, of the current research. So we conducted a, a, a uh, an online survey among 2,700 Nigerian adults, but our our sample was obviously not nationally representative. So um, and 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 the sample that we collected was online. We used Facebook targeting to to collect our to recruit our sample. So. The first avenue of future research is to extend this research into a nationally representative sample and see how people in different contexts in Nigeria think about these issues. Because clearly, when you do an, an online survey in English, um, you introduce certain biases in your survey sample. Uh, you, you often have a higher educated, relatively higher educated uh, group that you talk to, but you also, and which is often urban based. But you obviously in, 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 in many, uh, well, in Nigeria, for sure, uh, many people live in rural areas. So you, you miss out on those on, on, on those people. So that will be a first step to extend it in Nigeria in a, in a national uh, towards a more national representative sample. The other thing is to extend it to other countries. As I said, uh, many there has not been a lot of research on this, uh, particularly in the global south. I think many of these studies could be extended to other cases. And, and and could see and could lead to uh, to certain comparisons uh, between countries. A third avenue, a third broad avenue, could actually be to further um, zoom in on perceptions of horizontal inequalities. Now, what we find is indeed that people's perceptions of the prevailing severity uh, of the uh, of the prevailing uh, horizontal inequalities is an important driver of, of of their attitudes towards redistribution. But how stable these perceptions are and whether they change over time and what are the drivers of, of, um, of people's perceptions that, that are interesting elements as well. And, and, and again, uh, not much has been done in this in a systematic way. So that would be definitely very intriguing to further uh, zoom in on. Now, fourthly, I think there is also... We obviously only we we had four main hypotheses that we tested, and that were four um, mechanisms or four drivers of the prevailing uh, attitudes towards redistribution. There are obviously elements that we haven't looked at, right? Um, people's perceptions of social mobility, for instance, we haven't looked at that because we hadn't any data on it. But that could be interesting if people think that. Um, social mobility you, you, there, there is much higher than than uh, than other people's think. That might have an impact on their attitudes because they think, well, there, there's a chance that you made it on yourself, or on that might influence whether the, the government-led redistribution is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is clearly what I find intriguing in that regard would also be whether we could give certain information cues about the objective situation and whether that could actually help change people's uh, perceptions of the prevailing horizontal inequalities and by that change people's attitudes. I think that that will be interesting as well uh, in that regard. So plenty of, of, of avenues with fascinating research to, to, uh, to be done.
still a lot to work on the topic, many, many yeah. venues ahead. Uh, you made a very good reflection before um, about the policy impact of these perceptions and how they should be added to considerations uh, to policy impact beyond just the objective case. But let us know more about like, your personal thoughts, your personal reflections after looking at this uh, at these findings. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, doing research, I've been doing a lot of, uh, for a long time, research on horizontal inequality. And I, I always, well, the first 10 years, I looked at the relation between the presence of, of group-based inequalities and these horizontal inequalities and the risk of violent conflict. And it was sort of a natural evolution going into, but how do people perceive? Because actually people um, act and react on the basis of their perception of reality rather than some objective standards that policymakers or academics might, might be aware of. Um, and that realization is really fascinating because as I said, I, by just talking about future avenues of research, I, to me, finding evidence that perceptions are such an important driver of, of these attitudes. Um, and with that, the possibility of, of actually doing something about these inequalities. Uh, yeah, that I find fascinating. I'm And, and intriguing for me, the, uh, myself, and, and something that we're working on, we're starting to work on, uh, is whether indeed experimental research can can find out, by means of experimental research, you can find out whether these certain informational cues can actually help correct people's misperception of the prevailing situation. Because I do find that very important. If we think about um, the way people, where people get their news from or where people get their information from and, and how they sometimes are manipulated in political context uh, during election times and, and et cetera. Correcting and, and having making sure that people have a correct perception of the situation might actually be very important, not only for creating support for policies that are actually necessary in order to, um, to, to improve the situation vis-a-vis -vis horizontal inequalities, but I also think it's absolutely necessary from a point of view, from a long-term stability point of view, to address these inequalities. Um, there's been a huge amount of research that has linked the presence of these inequalities to an increased risk of political instability, violent conflicts, and economic inefficiencies. Now, if we can make that clearer, if that becomes clearer to people and that there is a need to redistribute in order to overcome these inequalities, that could really help contribute towards making more stable and, and, and socially cohesive societies. But it's 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 a difficult and long uh, policy process. Let, let that be clear. Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, it's perfect. And now the, uh, the challenge, but uh, the other way around. So if you had to, these reflections of yours, these findings, if you had to sum up into sentences, this passion you just showed uh, for the topic mm -hmm. in two sentences, what would it be? It would be perceptions matter. Uh, just looking at the objective situation is not enough. If you want to improve and, and make multi-ethnic societies that are that are confronted with severe inequalities, which are many countries in the world, um, if you want to help them become more stable and, and socially cohesive country, uh, societies, you need to address these inequalities. And you can only do that. You can only find the, the necessary popular support for policies that you need to introduce if you understand the perceptions mm -hmm. that lay at the basis of these attitudes. Okay. It was a great episode. Arnim, thank you very much. Thank you. So for those who are watching us on YouTube, uh, all the resources, all the materials, the article and the thematic issue that Arnim uh, referred to in this conversation, you can find them uh, in the link of the description and on the Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website. The description also includes uh, links to uh, our Twitter account, uh, for our journal, Social Inclusion, uh, to our newsletter. So I invite you all to um, follow up on them.